Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Let's set the plate for the day. Dr. Vanita Rahman, she is here to answer your health and nutrition questions when we open up the doctor's mailbag. Also going to be recapping the amazing International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine 2020 edition. Dr. Rahman, looking forward to catching up with you. So if you have a question, question, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now she will be prescribing answers in just a little bit. Also today, a healthy heart is a happy heart. We have details on a new study showing an overwhelming number of cardiac patients also are malnourished. We'll give you the details on that and the scoop on somewhere in the world where the sale of junk food to minors has been outlawed in an effort to curb obesity. We'll give you the details when we open up the health headlines in just a little bit, but we start today in the heart of the nation's capital, Washington, DC. That is where a group of doctors are protesting outside the headquarters of the USDA, demanding that the truth be told about dairy and that milk does far more harm to the body than it does good. And outside the USDA is where we find Hi, Dr. Neil Barnard. Good We're to see you, sir. We're here at the Department of Agriculture where the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee has issued a report. And despite the fact that we have decades of research showing that dairy products increase the risk of prostate cancer, increase the risk of digestive problems, increase the risk of breast cancer, and despite the fact that these take a disproportionate toll among certain groups in the United States, the USDA is still cheerleading for dairy products. That's racism, and it's got to stop. We are speaking out inside at the hearings here at the USDA. We've been sharing comments. Our experts are speaking out. This is going to change, and the question is when. Our answer is now. Back to you, Chuck. Dr. Barnard, looking forward to having you back on the show with us tomorrow. Uh, but right now, we're also going to be uh, asking you to go ahead and put your questions for Dr. Rahman in the comments section as we open up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. You can also tweet them to us at Chuck Carroll WLC or at PCRM. Just make sure that you use the hashtag exam room live. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Tuesday, August 11th, 2020. As the coronavirus continues to spread like wildfire here in the U.S., it also shows little signs of slowing down on a global level. The total number of confirmed infections worldwide now stands at 20 million, the caseload having doubled in the last six weeks after taking six months to reach 10 million confirmed cases. More than a quarter of all infections are in the U.S. Meanwhile, Russia's President Vladimir Putin says his country has won the race to develop a coronavirus vaccine and that it will be made available to millions of residents as soon as this month. But global health officials are cautioning to take that announcement with a grain of salt, worrying that the country is moving too fast. The vaccine is being rolled out before clinical trials have been completed. One top U.S. health official telling Congress last month that having a vaccine ready to distribute before you do testing is problematic at best. In other news, re new research is raising the question whether mouthwash can help protect against the spread of the coronavirus. That's interesting. Researchers in Germany tested eight commercially available brands, finding that some do in fact kill coronavirus cells that had built up in the mouth. Scientists say that will not, however, protect anyone from becoming infected, but it may help prevent someone who is infected from spreading the virus to others by killing those germs in the mouth before they speak. The study finds some mouthwashes are more effective than others, with Listerine ranking among the best. The study was published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. Also today, new evidence that we should be eating as if our heart depended on it. In a study of nearly 5,000 heart patients, nearly 72 were considered to be malnourished. That is alarming finding from the American College of Cardiology. Researchers say a significant number of patients were either overweight or obese, but the groups with the highest rates of malnourishment were actually underweight or of normal weight. Also underscoring the importance of diets in the study, more than 16% of participants died within three and a half years, while 20% suffered a second heart attack or a stroke. Plant-based diets, meanwhile, have been shown to improve and in some cases completely reverse heart disease. 
And finally, there is a major, major junk food crackdown underway in southern Mexico where the sale of high-calorie snacks to children has been outlawed. Lawmakers in Oaxaca have passed legislation banning the sales of things like chips and soda to anyone under the age of 18 unless they are accompanied by a parent. The bill also bans vending machines in schools. The drastic move comes as the country battles one of the highest rates of childhood obesity in the world, and Mexican officials have also been blaming junk food for the alarmingly high number of middle-aged residents who have died from COVID-19. I want to bring Dr. Vanita Rahman in to talk about this one. Uh, Dr. Rahman, no surprise that this law is getting a lot of pushback down in Mexico, a lot of controversy here. And I know that here in the U.S., less strict measures have been put in place, like taking vending machines out of schools. But short of this outright outlaw, what can parents do to really keep this food out of the mouths of their children and, and keep them eating a healthy diet? What, what can they do? Yeah, this is such a struggle, Chuck, for most parents. Um, you know what? The problem we have in the U.S. is it's almost like a toxic food environment for young kids that they're growing up in. It's whether it's the cafeteria food in school or the vending machines everywhere or even at any kind of youth athletic event after that soccer game or ice hockey tournament. It's followed by a junk food fest. There's a lot of candy and chips and hot dogs. And it's just become part of the popular culture. And it's it can seem like an uphill battle, especially for parents who want to offer healthier snacks. Um, I, I find it's really helpful to first educate the kids and let them know. But if you have really young kids, they don't care about health. They're not worried about diabetes or heart disease. Um, but talk to them about other concerns that do matter to them, the humane aspect of it. The kids generally love animals and that really resonates with them. Talk to them about the environment, especially adolescents. They feel very passionately about animals and the environment, and that could be a good angle to explain how these foods are not only harming us, they're harming the planet. They're, they're causing problems for animals worldwide. And then as parents, just don't bring them into the house. Um, if they're not in the house, kids won't have them. And then, um, as you start introducing healthier foods, kids develop a taste for them. They're much less likely to reach for these cookies or candy bars um, or granola bars. Uh, you know, if, but if we keep introducing them to these foods, if we keep serving them, then that's what they develop a taste for. But it is a really tough challenge for parents. And um, it, it's important to get that conversation going, why this is important, and then talk to your kids about what would feel comfortable for you? What can you snack on when you get together with your friends? What would feel cool, but still be healthy and start these conversations and keep the kids engaged? And, you know, I think that you really hit the nail on the head uh, as far as like the younger kids. I remember speaking to someone on the show not too terribly long ago, mm -hmm. and they were drawing the correlation between the popularity of spinach among children and when Popeye the cartoon was ultra mm -hmm. popular, you know, because he was strong to the finish because he eats right. his spinach. Right. And that kind of made spinach this mythical, amazing food instead of, you know, a box of Lucky Charms. So maybe, maybe the solution lies in just creating a whole bunch of superheroes in the produce section, like Captain Asparagus or something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, and now you've brought up a really good point, Chuck. Um, the other thing that kids love uh, and look up to are athletes. And so talk about elite athletes who are changing their game and really kicking it up a notch and performing at their best by eating a healthy diet. Um, that is really cool. And that's something that most kids can really relate to. Um, so it's, we don't, maybe we don't even need these mythical characters. We've got some real life superheroes who are using healthy diets to change their performance. Yeah. Can you imagine if Michael Jordan was endorsed by, uh, I don't know, you know, like a pineapple brand, like Dole Pineapple, right? So instead of being like Mike and drinking Gatorade, like you reach for a pineapple, right? And right. suddenly you're draining three pointers like nobody's business, right? So I, I think that that could also help out, you know, as well. But it all comes down to marketing and, and education and having been a child who was raised on this junk food and, and knowing how 
badly you can become addicted to this stuff at such a young age. I think really though, the solution is it's not just educating children, it's educating the parents. So it, sure. you know, giving them something like a bag of potato chips isn't a second thought. Like it needs to be a first thought because it's not just something to snack on. Like you are really, I don't mean to sound like an alarmist here, but having been there myself, you are really harming your child by giving them mm -hmm. this bag of potato chips, even though it's something that you think that they want. Yeah, uh, you know, so important, Chuck. I think you brought up two points. One is kids eat what we as parents eat. So setting a good example is really important. If we're munching on the snacks and cookies and soda, well, that's that sends a message that it's okay. And then the kids reach for it. So really leading by example is very important. And the other thing is sometimes I think parents tend to think because children are generally healthier, it doesn't matter what they eat. You know, they'll burn it off. They'll work it off. They don't need to worry. They're thin. Um, but what's really interesting is that we're seeing rising rates of obesity in children. And I was recently looking at a research study that was done to evaluate heart disease you talked about a heart study that came out heart disease and when it starts and um in this research study the team looked at autopsies of the youth that had you know ages between ages of 15 and 34 who had died from some kind of traumatic event um and then autopsies were done to see if they had evidence of cardiovascular disease and can you guess chuck what percentage of them had cardiovascular disease we're talking ages 15 through 34, really young people. I'm going to bet that it's right around 50%. Was it that high? Well, I'm going to say you're not even close, Chuck. Oh, dear. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sadly, 100% had no. evidence. No. Yeah. No. Already. Yeah. So these are boys and girls, um, African Americans and Caucasians, and all of them across all age groups, gender, and races there was early evidence of cardiovascular disease when their blood vessels were examined. So it starts very early and it's not a matter of if we develop it, the issue is how can we prevent it from becoming symptomatic? Holy Moses. All right, so here's what's gonna happen, right? We gotta pause this discussion and move on, but I need for you to do two things. One, to send me that study and two, carve out about a half an hour, 45 minutes of your time because I wanna bring you on the exam room podcast where we have more time to really go in depth because I think that you have just stumbled across something that is just mind-blowingly important. So yeah, let's make that a reality. Absolutely, so important we talk about this. No doubt. And let's go ahead and move on right now. I know that the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine just wrapped up over the last weekend. You were just talking about new research. Uh, you just had 72 hours, three full days worth of it, uh, including some of your own presentation. So what were your big takeaways from the conference? Uh, well, first of all, it was amazing. We had almost 900 attendees. It's amazing. There are 900 healthcare providers who are so committed to helping their patients with um, common sense diet and lifestyle changes, which we know are the cornerstone of managing chronic disease. Um, but there were so many great presentations. So um, for starters, I talked about the role of nutrition in blood pressure. And we know that from the DASH study that was done, that was published in the New England Journal when it came out that people who consume a diet high in fruits and vegetables, low in fat, and low in sodium could reduce their blood pressure by nearly 10 points. And this is really significant, Chuck, because this is about the reduction we expect with a medication. But here we're doing it with a diet that's not only helping our blood pressure, but it's gonna help everything else. And then for people who have what we call resistant hypertension, where you know, it, despite taking three medications, they're not able to decrease their blood pressure into the target range, reducing their sodium intake, um, drop their blood pressure by 22 points. Uh, so let me just say that again, just by reducing their sodium intake, they could lower their blood pressure by 22 points. Again, this is something we don't even get with medications in the clinic. So it's that important. And high blood pressure plays a role in heart disease, in stroke, um, in chronic kidney disease. And so what causes high blood pressure is related to all of these other things too. Then 
The other exciting topic we brought up this year, something new was culinary medicine where um, a team of us talked to our attendees about how uh, healthcare providers can talk to their patients about practical tips about culinary medicine. You know, it's one thing to say, eat a low fat plant-based diet, but what does that really mean? If your patient is from India, or if, their pa if your patient is from Italy, or if your patient is from Louisiana, what does that mean? Or, or if you know they're used to Latino food, what what should they be eating? How can we help them? Um, so really practical tips. And one thing we talked about is most ethnic cuisines um, are naturally healthy. They're low fat, but over the years they've been modified due to Westernization, where they've become more animal based, food heavy more high in fat, more calorically dense, and we want to get back to our ethnic roots. So that was very exciting. But some of my favorite talks were um, one by Dr. Alan um, Desmond, who talked about Crohn's disease. And this I know comes up a lot. I see patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. These are a type of diseases that cause chronic inflammation in the small and large intestine. And there are two types, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and it, they're really tough diseases to manage. Patients suffer a lot. They have chronic abdominal pain, diarrhea, rectal bleeding, and their life pretty much becomes defined by these symptoms. And Dr. Desmond presented amazing data about how a plant-based diet can not only put someone in remission, but keep them in remission, which is truly amazing because the medications that we have to treat these diseases are about 50% effective and they come with a long list of side effects which can compromise the immune system, which with this COVID-19 pandemic we're learning, it's so important to maintain a robust immune system. So really remarkable information. So if any of you have inflammatory bowel disease, talk to your doctor, ask them to talk to you about the role of diet because the literature is out there and it can really help you. Yeah, Dr. Desmond, his presentations are, are just always just so extraordinary. He's been on the show uh, recently, and I mean, it was just some of our more popular episodes, to be honest with you, just because he he puts it together so well. You know, he mm -hmm. he's able to really relay that information so it sticks with the audience, and he really is able to also just pick out those super important details in each of the studies to to share that. Um, but he also, you know. It, I think Crohn's disease by and large is one of the more overlooked diseases if you don't have it, like it's not really on your radar, mm -hmm. even though more people have IBS or Crohn's than than most even realize. I didn't realize the number is, is it, uh, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but I, I know that it's, it's right up there, one in 10, one out of 12, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, and, and what's also concerning is, as you pointed out, the incidence is increasing, the prevalence is increasing. Again, highlighting that, you know, we haven't changed genetically. These are, if these were just genetics, then why would the prevalence rise? Our genes aren't changing that rapidly, but it really goes into, you know, it's a combination of genes and lifestyle and diet that's all coming together to create this perfect storm. And as our diet has changed, uh, in the wrong direction, the prevalences of these chronic diseases are going up significantly. No question. And so let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag now. Make sure that you submit your questions for Dr. Rahman in the comments section, or you can tweet them to us at Chuck Carroll WLC or at PCRM. Just make sure that when you send it, you use that hashtag exam room podcast. Now, picking up where we left off with that discussion about these unhealthy foods and the rise in prevalence of IBS, but also specific to kids, we have uh, Deanna here at 1213. She's got a comment here. Maybe you can offer her some advice. She she said, healthy plant-based foods are all I ever offer my children, but now they're older and they've been exposed to junk through their schools and their friends, and that's all they want now. So how can a parent really help to keep those outside influences at bay and the junk food out of their mouths when they're not inside the house? Yeah, this is so hard. Um, you know, when kids are young, we have a lot more control over what they're eating as they get older, especially as they become preteens or teens. Um, they they have new freedoms and they can choose foods. They have money to buy it um, and their friends may offer them foods. It's that much more challenging. But uh, what I found with kids is it's really important to talk to them about why this matters, about why 
the food matters, not just for their health, but for the health of the planet, for the health of the animals, and one of, or athletic performance if your child is an athlete. And one of these four will stick with them. One of these four is something they can relate to and they will want to pursue it more. But what I'm also finding with teenagers is on the one hand, it can be tricky, but on the other hand, they understand things better, so it's easier. But a lot of teens are genuinely interested in trying plant-based or vegan. And the next time they have their friends over, order a, a vegan pizza or serve up veggie burgers. And um, I've done this with my kids. Um, and it was amazing how open and receptive their friends were. It may not have been something they had thought about, but once they tried it, they were amazed how much they liked it. And they were open to exploring this more and more. But it is it does take time. Um, it does take persistence. But eventually that message really sticks with them that this really matters. All right. Let's uh, switch gears. A completely different question here. But uh, uh, this is an interesting one. So I need for you to uh, think about the most important meal of the day. That's what Mike is asking here. He wants you to rate his breakfast. So he says, how would you rate this breakfast? <laughs> I mix together 1000 grams of whole road oats, 100 grams of sunflower seeds, another 100 grams of pumpkin seeds, 200 grams of chia seeds. He's very specific. Another 200 of ground flax seeds, 100 more ground sesame seed grams, 100 grams of poppy seeds, uh, some coconut in a bowl. Then he adds uh, some frozen berries. His favorite, he says, are cranberries and sour cherries. And then he adds just a teaspoon of sugar and some non-dairy milk. He refrigerates that for about 60 minutes and then he goes to town. So you hear all of those things. How would you rate that breakfast? I'm going to ask you on a scale of one to 10. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, uh, a 10 for keeping it all plant-based. This is great. Um, and getting the whole grains in there, the oats are always whole grain, whether they're uh, steel cut or rolled or instant. That's great. And then getting the fruits in there. So that's wonderful. Um, and it's not high in added sugars, which is great. My only concern would be about the amount of seeds um, that are going in there. Seeds are a high fat food. They're about 70 to 80% fat in calories. So if someone is trying to lower their weight or lower their blood sugar, they may want to reduce the amount of seeds they're adding. But if that's not an issue and you know your blood sugars look good and you're at a healthy weight, then I think that's fine. So the key there is the seeds, like flax seeds, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, they all provide healthy fats, but we just need a little bit too much could lead to weight gain. It could raise blood sugars for someone who has prediabetes or diabetes. That would be my only caution. What about that teaspoon of added sugar as well? Is that problematic there? So I know, I know some people follow the very strict SOS diet, you know, salt, oil, sugar free. And, and so let's be clear about this. Added sugar has zero health benefits. It has no nutrients. It's just empty calories. Um, and we're just adding it for flavor. So it's up to you. If you if you like that sweetness and you want it, I think the key is to really minimizing it. A teaspoon and in, in that much food probably isn't overdoing it, but you know, um, using a few tablespoons might be a lot. So it's really you want to dial down the sweetness and use as little as you can while still enjoying your meal. That's how I see it. All right. Uh, let's get the question from Hogan at 1211 wants to know, Dr. Rahman, how can you treat fungal acne? I'm assuming uh, speaking through nutrition standpoint. So how can food help cure acne? Yeah. So uh, acne is uh, highly prevalent. We often think of it as something that just afflicts teenagers. But in fact, a great deal of adults also suffer from acne. And one thing we know is that acne um, is influenced by what we eat. So for example, high fat foods, animal foods, and then dairy products can worsen acne. Foods with a high glycemic index can worsen acne. So I would recommend if you're not already, um, go on a low fat plant-based diet, try that, that can have a profound impact. And then um, also talk to your healthcare providers if there are any other hormonal imbalances that could be contributing. And um, I avoid, uh, rigorous, uh, you know, health, just typical face hygiene is good, but avoid any 
harsh chemicals or astringents that can sometimes cause more damage. But from a nutrition perspective, low fat, plant-based, um, we know can make a difference. And then keeping that glycemic index low is also important. I know that there are studies that are still being done on this. So um, do what you can with this question. 1223 from Phoebe wants to know, can a plant-based diet help with a COVID damaged heart? In the past week or so, there's been a lot to come out about the potential side effects uh, or damage that the virus can do to the heart. So what do we know as far as how a diet may help out with that? Yeah, you know, Phoebe, you're asking a question that I think many others are probably wondering about. Um, we just don't know, um, not just about a damaged heart, but other sequelae from COVID-19. Some people may suffer lung damage um, or so loss of smell or taste. We just don't know the long-term data from the virus itself, what things look like six months, 12 months, two years down the line. Um, and we certainly don't know enough about nutrition yet. All we know right now is that a healthy diet can prevent many of the comorbidities that are associated with a more complicated course of COVID-19. Um, beyond that, we just don't have the research yet. Great question from Tatum at 1228. Something that I think Dr. Shivam Joshi was talking about at ICNM. Uh, Tatum wants to know, are low fat diets beneficial to someone with kidney stones? Yeah, so actually it, it seems they are. And I'm glad you brought this up. This was also one of the key takeaways from ICNM was, Low fat plant based diets can help with chronic kidney disease too. Um, reduce stone formation, absolutely. Uh, and often that's not included in the conversation when treatment is discussed, but definitely look into it. And then low fat plant based diets can help with other risk factors for chronic kidney disease, such as high blood pressure and diabetes, which are the two most common. Here's a question that comes up quite often. Uh, so let's go ahead and get another answer on this one. It's from Miriam at 1228. Is stevia a natural better replacement for sugar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's stevia. So um, this, this is, so let me backtrack a little bit. It's about adding sweetness to our food. And traditionally we would add caloric sweeteners like sugar or maple syrup or agave or molasses. Um, all of these are just basically added sugar. Then the food industry came up with artificial sweeteners, which are non-caloric, so they don't have sh uh, added calories, they don't have any calories, but they're a few hundred times sweeter than natural sugar. And so the problem with that is it reinforces the sweet tooth. We keep wanting sweetness. And we also know from research that people who consume them actually do not lose weight, do not improve their blood sugar values. It's counterintuitive, but it's because of two things. A, we overcompensate for them by consuming more calories. And we also get our brain used to a sweet tooth. So we keep craving for sweet foods. Now, as far as stevia and monk fruit, these are also non-caloric sweeteners. So they don't provide any calories, but they're natural. They're not a product of the food industry per se. They're derived from natural plants. But I'm always a little bit wary of these also because they're also um, much, much sweeter than sugar. And again, because we know that they don't bring calories, I fear that they may have the same impact on us where, you know, if we're having a drink with stevia, we may think, well, those calories don't count. So let me compensate for that by getting more calories elsewhere. That's just human nature. That's what we've done with diet soda. And we may do the same with this. And the other thing is that overly sweet taste is going to reinforce that sweet craving. So we'll keep reaching for sweet things. Um, so I generally recommend just going with table sugar or one of the more standard sweeteners and just really minimizing it and dialing down how much sweetness we like. Final question is more of a comment than anything. It comes to us from Jean at 12.30. Jean says, I went 30 days, no sugar, so I have no desire for it anymore. And so my question then becomes, Dr. Rahman, is completely eliminating sugar from the diet the only way to rid yourself of the sweet tooth? Uh, well, we don't know, uh, you know, so that's, that's, but I think Jean is bringing up a really good point, which is that our taste buds change. They're meant to change. So when Jean stopped adding sugar or sweeteners, um, didn't crave that sweet taste anymore. 
Um, so again, sugar has no health benefit. And if you can do that, great. If you can use fruits as your dessert, that's perfect. That's ideal. But I think many people find they're not able to do that, in which case really bringing down the sweetness. And to illustrate this point, um, whenever I travel, I'm struck that in many Asian countries, when they serve cookies or something, they're just not as sweet as they are here. Um, but people find them just as satisfying because they've gotten used to a much less sweet taste. So we can do the same thing here. Even if we can't go all sugar free, we could dial it down. So instead of two teaspoons in our coffee, let's try a teaspoon and see. And after a few days, that may feel just sweet enough. And we've cut out those unnecessary calories. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, don't worry. We save each and every one that comes in and we will try to do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Dr. Rahman, real quick before I let you go, uh, I know that you are as busy as ever over at the Barnard Medical Center, given all of the states that just came online. How are things going there? Oh, it's terrific. You know, I'm connecting with people all over the country and it's really wonderful that we're able to provide this. We are now seeing patients in Florida, um, I can't even keep up. Indiana, <laughs> Illinois, <laughs> Pennsylvania. I've got the full list. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, a lot of states. And it's it's been just so invaluable. And I what I'm hearing over and over again is that most patients were waiting for us to be available. You know, they, they didn't think it was possible to see some a plant-based doctor that's situated in Washington, D.C. and they're thrilled. So it's been just a terrific experience. Outstanding. And uh, I know, yeah, every day it's, it seems like somebody is asking, when is my state coming? When is my state coming? Well, the, I mean, we've added five in the last two, maybe three weeks. And I know that there are a couple more that are pending and and hopefully some more beyond that still. Uh, as of right now, it's more than a quarter of the country that's covered. So here is the full list where you can get a, an appointment. It is uh, in Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Florida, Georgia, and right here in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. Again, more than a quarter of the country and new states hopefully coming online very, very soon. So I know, just as I said, you are as busy as ever. That's a lot, a lot of people that you get the opportunity to meet with now. Yeah, and I'm so grateful for the technology to do telehealth visits because it's such a wonderful way to connect with people and provide care for them. Yep. And go ahead and book your appointment today by visiting barnardmedical.org or picking up the phone, doing it old school, calling 202-527-7500. Dr. Vanita Rahman, greatly appreciate your time today, my friend. Thank you so much, Chuck. All right. Coming up on the show tomorrow, physician turned environmentalist Sophia Pineda Ochoa. She will be here to talk her about her new film, Endgame 2050. What will the future be like? 30 years from now. Well, the film gives us a glimpse into that. And right now she says that things are not looking so pretty. So tomorrow we are going to learn what we can do to tackle the existential crises bearing down on the planet with Dr. Pineda Ochoa. So that is right back here on the exam room live tomorrow at noon. Eastern. And also don't forget to subscribe to the exam room podcast by the physicians committee over on Apple podcast and wherever you get your podcasts. If you do that, please also leave that five-star rating. We would greatly appreciate it. New episode out today, as a matter of fact. So go ahead and give that a listen right now. My thanks to our director, our producer, Laura Anderson. She is Wonder Woman doing everything today, making the magic happen behind the scenes. So Laura, thank you very much. And for Dr. Rahman and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based. <laughs>